morning, good afternoon and good evening to one and all who have connected with us today for KPIT Sparkle Technical Talks. My name is Rutuja Rane and I am greatly honored to be your host for this event. We are here today to explore the latest technological advancements and to hear some of the most innovative minds in the industry. This is a great opportunity for us to grow, learn and be inspired. So let's get started. Hi, um, I'm Dan Goldsmith, or Dr. Dan Goldsmith. I'm a um, lecturer at Coventry University, and I'm going to give you a talk today on my views of automotive security. Uh, so let's start with our first thing. All right, so a little bit about myself. So I'm Dr. Daniel Goldsmith. I'm an assistant professor in ethical hacking and cyber security at Coventry University. I'm the course director for our undergraduate course in ethical hacking and cyber security and I'm also curriculum lead for the suite of security related courses that we have running at Coventry. A little bit about my background. So my background is in wireless sensor networks, uh, the internet of things before it was the internet of things, I suppose, um, dealing with embedded systems, low level hardware development, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I moved into security, uh, it's a branch of computer science where we get to see all the interesting low-level interactions and how they affect the security of our programs, right, affect our lives, right? And it means I get to teach wonderful topics from penetration testing, so breaking into websites, breaking into computers, right down to exploit development. So things like writing viruses, dealing with that assembly code at the low-level side of things. The interesting thing for talking about mobility and the kind of things that KPID do is I'm not really an automotive cybersecurity expert. No, I leave that to some of my colleagues. But today I'm going to talk with my higher level view of how I see my visions for security, what problems we might have in terms of automotive in this exciting time as we're adding new, new technology to our cars, new technology to our our products. Uh, so let's give you a little bit of background on what we've got from my point of view. All right. Technology is rapidly evolving. Now I know KPRT are doing some wonderful things here. Come up and see some of the projects that you're doing. Right. And you're putting cutting edge technologies into cars right. or into automotive. You're designing products like the traffic avoidance systems or collision avoidance systems. You're dealing with some really complex technical things. You know, it's really exciting to me because when we consider what cutting edge cars were like even five years ago and how we're moving forward the new things that we're putting in, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I think fully autonomous vehicles are going to be a way off. Right. Just thinking about this last night. So we haven't got fully autonomous systems and aircraft yet. And I think they're actually more likely than fully autonomous, so fully autonomous cars to come into place because we've got difficulties with unexpected things. The challenges you're going to face with developing autonomous vehicles are much harder problems than developing things like automated flights or automated mass transport systems like trains. So assistance is here to stay. So things like parking assistance, things like the lane departure systems and rest. They're going to be here to stay. So we'll start off with a little question here, I suppose, where the game I like to play with my students when we talk about the complexity. But, and which of these systems is more complex? If 25 years ago, the first film Jurassic Park came out, right, they were wonderfully cutting edge computer system that was in that, involved in this city, in that, right? Or is it the Airbus? Uh, the Airbus? Is it the Boeing 787? Their flagship brand new airliner? Is it the Ford? Raptor? Or is it the Mouse? Right. And we think about this. Million lines of code. Now, as developers, we know with millions of lines of code is not really a brilliant metric 
the things, but it gives us some idea of the complexity of our programs. Right. So Jurassic Park, okay, it was 25 years ago, but that way did at 2 million lines of code. The Boeing 787, 14 million lines of code. Right. So we've got a few orders of magnitude more complex in the system uh, between these things. The mouse, and I'm cheating here a little bit, weighs in at about 130 million lines of code. Right. Now, as I say, I'm cheating here. If we take a line of code to be a genome pair, right, then the mouse has that many things in its in its DNA. Finally, we've got the Ford F-150, right, one of its new trucks. And that is 150 million lines of code that go into running that car, right, going to running the systems inside of that car. That's 10 times more complex than the software that goes into running a Boeing 787. And it just gives us an idea of the scale of complexity of the systems that we're dealing with. It gives an idea of the scale of, of how much work, how much effort goes into building these things. We then move on to the complexity problem. So we add new features to our vehicles. Uh, maybe we add web browsing to the in-car entertainment system. Right. There's got some uses for that. You know, maybe your driver can look for places to eat while he's out out on the road in an unfamiliar area. So adding this new functionality is really good. Right? It can be helpful to people. It can be helpful to our users. But this functionality leads to added complexity. Added complexity, from my point of view, with my hacking hat on, leads to a much wider attack surface, right? Because the more lines of code we've got, the more elements we've got inside our programs, the more elements we've got inside our vehicles, the more chance we have to make that mistake that's going to let an attacker um, take control of the system, right? Or exploit or influence the system in, in different ways. There we go. We've got the bad guy now, um, how can we exploit these this wider attack surface? And these are the questions we like to ask ourselves. So let's have a look at some examples of current issues in automotive security. Right. And some of these you may have heard of, some of them are more research researchy side of things. But they, I find these fascinating, just the different ways that people come up with attacking. Right, our first example is relay and replay attacks. Right. Now, keyless entry systems, very common, very desirable in our vehicles, but they give us an interesting attack surface. Um, so the first style of attack we can use is what we call a replay attack. Uh, and here, <clears throat> your bad guy captures the signal that's being used to unlock a car, mm -hmm. records it, uh, we can do this with an inexpensive piece of kit called a software-defined radio. Uh, I've got a student doing projects on this at the moment. Right? And then we replay the attack to the car. Now, if there's no security mechanisms put in place, uh, then that replay attack will just work. So there's no checks, there's no balances, there's no rolling codes or anything put in place. But a relay replay attack, style attack, will work like that. Fortunately, manufacturers have got wise to this. We've added things like rolling codes uh, to the security systems, to the entry systems, that make it hard for us to reuse the same um, the same signal. Uh, but instead, the attackers have moved on to a relay style attack. Right? They act here as a man in the middle to forward the unlock code, and it looks something like this. You know, so we have our two attackers. Um, they commonly use mobile phones or devices like this. Um, at one stands next door to the vehicle. Uh, the other stands somewhere near the keys or somewhere near wherever the key fob is. Right? Now, the distance normally between the car and the key fob is too great, that signal to be transmitted. But by moving close between them, and transmitting the signal between, in this case, they're using mobile phones 
I'm going to say in other cases, we can use inexpensive devices, uh, but have a radio chip in board. They're able to forward that signal from the key fob, but maybe inside the house, right, to the vehicle. From there, they can unlock it, they can start it, they can steal the vehicle. All right. There's some interesting mitigation around relay attacks. Right, these things still exist. They are really acknowledged problems. Uh, companies like Jag, Land Rover, who are just up the road from us, are looking at latency or the latency between these signals to help mitigate the problem. So we look at the time taken from the challenge to come from the car to the key fob and the response to come back from the key fob as a way to detect whether that signal is being tampered with, whether it's being forwarded by something else. And this is a similar approach that's used by uh, banking. So your contactless bank cards nowadays or contactless cards nowadays, they have checks on the latency that's being used. They have a checks on the time taken, time of flight of the signal. And they use that to provide some extra security. Uh, so automotive is moving into this. Our second attack. Yeah. And this would really be inspiration for the title of my piece, is uh, what, what's been called Phantoms. This is a really interesting research on Teslas. And people are projecting images onto the road, onto the side of buildings, or onto things like trees. All right. So they'll project an image of a person onto the road. Um, and the car vision system detects this. Now, the car vision system can't tell whether this is a real person or whether it's this just image that's being projected and they're able to use this to modify the car's behavior by projecting an image of a person onto the road in front of the car they can trigger the auto stop system all right or they can trigger that the car won't start because it detects that a person is in front of it one of the other interesting elements and we can see this just here with the roads with the speed sign is they can transmit different speeds and the autopilot system or the drive assist system here will detect that road sign right or that fake road sign and slow the car down or modify the car's speed based upon what it's seeing here with vision and the really interesting thing that i found about this paper really interesting thing about this pilot attack is <clears throat> they can project the image at a fr frame rate uh, but humans can't see. But the computer vision system in the car is able to. So we can make these invisible signs that can affect the behavior of the car, change the way that it behaves. So that's another really fascinating style of attack that's being used on um, automotive. Other examples, now to look at this earlier today. So now manufacturers like BMW are adding let's call them hidden features to your car, right? Rather than buying the S class and then the A class model or however BMW work, right? We buy the one standard car and then we unlock these features, these added features um, through the manufacturer, right? At some point, they're looking probably at going to like a monthly subscription, whatever you have. Now, again, this is an attack surface, right? At some point, there's a communication between the car and a server somewhere. If we've got this piece of communication, then we can affect how it works and we can change those settings that are going across. And just a quick Google um, about unlocking these hidden features, activating these extra things, show us that there's products available on the web that will let you change the functionality. I mean, 50, 50 euros to unlock the hidden feature in your car it's a lot cheaper than the manufacturer's proxy. And the final example we've got here, moving back to my world of hardware, um, we can't even trust things like trusted platform modules nowadays. So it's kind of an idea of how complex these systems get. Uh, we use trusted platform modules to validate computer systems. They're very important in embedded devices because we use them for cryptographic functions. Right? It's very hard to get decent entropy on a microcontroller. So we have these extra trips that are designed to provide this level of randomness that we use for cryptography. And 
just at the start of this week, uh, one of the larger trusted platform manufacturers um, has announced that they have a security flaw. Uh, it's really interesting. It's a buffer overflow style attack. So we can override a couple of bytes at the end of um, a message that we sent to the trusted platform module and either stop it from executing or manipulate the code that's working or manipulate the behavior of a program. And we're still digging into quite how dangerous this is, but it's really exciting. It goes to show how supply chains and things like that are all linked together. So there's some examples. Let's give you some high-level thoughts from myself on this here. So cars, automotive, transport, cities, interconnected systems are all getting computationally more powerful. But one of the things that I see here with my hacking hat on is it's moving us from sort of the embedded constrained side of systems that we're used to uh, into more traditional computing. Right. It's much more likely but we'll be running something like a Raspberry Pi that's got a Linux system on or got embedded Windows running on it rather than the low-level hardware, you know, embedded operating system we might use. And this is exciting for me because it brings us much closer to traditional hacking. Hardware hacking is really hard. Right? There's only a few hundred people in the world right, that can do the very deep uh, research side of things into vulnerabilities, right? into vulnerabilities on hardware, into these specialist systems. But when it comes to more general purpose things like Unix, more general purpose things like Windows, right? we've got a much wider body of people that are able to do it. By adding functionality like web browsers, we're introducing huge new classes of um, vulnerabilities to our programs. You know, We have a web browser, we have maps. That's given us a new attack service as attackers to make use of. Yeah. I think but the future is really bright. Putting a computer in every car is going to be amazing. Right. I can't wait for the added safety uh, that come through these driver assist systems. You know, I can't wait to see where we move in the future uh, and where great people like yourself should take it are developing these new exciting products. Right. But we do need to consider the possible impacts. Right? We do need to consider how widening this stuff, adding this complexity is going to possibly impact on the security of our products. Right. And this means that our development teams, our software engineers, and our security teams need to work much closer together when we're designing, when we're developing the software, you know, rather than the siloed approach that we tend to have, or I've developed my system, now the security audit takes place. This should be happening at every stage of our production process. Right. So my summary in my talk. The right. future of automotive is really exciting. Right? So we're doing some wonderful things and developers are it's amazing, really amazing. Right. Uh, but we do need this caution when we're designing and developing, especially as we're moving much closer to these more traditional home computer styles of systems. So I feel we need to break this is these silos of security and development work, get people talking to each other at each stage of the process so we understand the considerations that we've got. I'm looking forward to seeing the projects that you've been working on for uh, KPIT Sparkle. It's always exciting to see engineers uh, coming together, seeing the wonderful research projects, development projects that you're doing around energy and mobility. And I'm looking forward to being part of the panel uh, for the events, for the awards events at the end of it, uh, and seeing the great work that you've been doing. Hello, everyone. Uh... My name is Paul Sanjay, and I lead off highway engineering for Dana in India. Um, I would like to thank KPT first to, uh, for offering me this opportunity. 
Today, I will be talking about balancing electrification technologies with evolving performance expectations. So before we jump into the topic, a quick overview about Dana. Dana is a technology company engaged in highly engineered powertrain, drivetrain systems, design and manufacturing to power vehicles and machines. Uh, in Dana, we have been working on electrified solutions since 2014. And till date, we have contributed to more than 3 billion uh, customer miles driven with our motors uh, from close to 40,000 vehicles that are in uh, service on the road today. Uh, this actually helped divert about uh, 5.4 uh, million metric tons of uh, CO2 emissions from cities. So balancing electrification technologies with uh, evolving performance expectations. Let's start by looking at how the megatrends are changing the landscape. It brings changes in powertrain technologies and business models. We are more and more looking at alternate energy sources to fossil fuels. You see the momentum on e-mobility, battery powered, fuel cell, electric, etc. Sustainability, which is a key aspect that is driving the need to accelerate the transformation. The emphasis uh, the megatrend puts on efficiency, right sizing. And then the uh, importance of predictive maintenance so that we address it before something goes wrong and extend the life of the product. Focus on advanced and disruptive technologies. So these are some of the areas that are impacted by the megatrends. While it impacts the way powertrain technologies are evolving, we also need to look at some of the challenges specific to electrification today. Starting with duty cycles. We all know duty cycles are one of the key elements to design a, a efficient drivetrain or powertrain system. Unicycles that we have historically acquired and used for ICE source. Now, how do we apply it to e-propulsion? What is needed to establish the link, the link between the drives and work functions, for instance, in, in case of, of highway machines, and vehicles where I come from. Electrification does not necessarily mean only for traction. There are some segments in off highway, ag in particular. Electrifying the machine for traction is a huge challenge beyond certain horsepower segment due to the architecture, the battery cost, infrastructure, etc. Efficiency of the drive and work functions and the power density versus the battery technology. So these are all some of the challenges uh, from a product standpoint. But then there are also process-related challenges in electrification. The development of new components that required performance levels. For example, Electric motors are going to be at uh, 10,000 plus RPM level. And the mechanical systems to uh, the, the bearing seals shall work efficiently at the speed levels. Engineering competencies are required in new areas. Uh, for instance, thermal management of the system to be efficient, very, very crucial. Managing the integration part, the integration responsibilities. 
and achieving the economies of scale at the current volume, so on and so forth. So we we just briefly talked about the megatrends impacting electrification and some of the challenges we have today. But if you look at the technology solutions for wind hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and battery electric vehicle, there are actually a wide range of them. From hybrid transmission, uh, hybrid axle, independent e-axle, direct drive, e-drive unit, rigid axle, wheel drive, so on and so forth. There's so much of a wide range of uh, options, uh, technology solution that we can offer. With all this technology evolution, it also means that there is a huge requirement of competence. So if I try to address or talk about the competence in three parts, the first one comes is the mechatronics competence. There's a huge requirement of mechatronics competence to meet this technological evolution. E-propulsion system capabilities would need a full suite of power electronic competence, the, the inverters, the software controls, etc. A broad range of motor types are involved. We all know permanent magnet, induction, synchronous reluctance, etc. The precision mechanical gears, whether it's bevel or parallel, or helical. In the electrodynamic, Obviously, we have high voltage systems, low voltage systems, motor controls. The second one is the thermal technology, the thermal management of the e-propulsion. So, developing the e-propulsion system requires very strong thermal management capabilities. The reason is the motor and the inverter temperatures must be managed for optimum performance. So design of integrated cooling system enables greater core density. It reduces the weight of the system. It allows to package the system in a smaller envelope for the several benefits. Efficient thermal dynamics become increasingly important when a motor and an inverter are integrated into mechanical systems, say for instance, an axle or a transmission or torque, so on and so forth. Another third dimension I would touch upon is the mechanical technology. We all know we have been making gears for maybe close to 100 years, but what is required now is enhanced gear products to support the electrification. So the perpendicular transfer of high torque through precision gears. So the parallel torque transfer via helical gears. So these are all extremely crucial to have a highly efficient electrified system. So having touched about the electrification technology, now let's look at the performance expectations. Safety. The first and foremost expectation from an electric uh, vehicle or electric machine. So the electric vehicle, as we all know, represent a, a complete different technology compared with the ICE. The electric vehicle system shall be designed to operate safely in all conditions. There are standards and regulations concerning electric vehicle safety. At a, at a powertrain level, we need to take care of functional safety and thermal management we just talked about. Then comes productivity. This is more applicable to, again, O5 where I come from. It is a given that the system yields the same level of productivity as that of an ICE. Maneuverability, durability, serviceability, total cost of ownership. None of these are new. All of these need to be in line or better than what is being offered by ICE. 
And then the system engineering, which is the most interesting and most relevant part. System engineering is going to play a huge role in optimizing the performance and achieving the expected outcome in terms of efficiency, productivity, total cost of ownership, etc., etc. So the architecture has a role to play in it as well. In the short term, the electric architecture solutions are engineered for existing vehicle frames, mission frames, at least in case of a 5 with transmissions modified for use with electric motors. This approach actually minimizes the effort, risk, and cost impact on existing platform development. But in the long term, longer battery run times and lower costs are expected, which would prompt OEMs to invest in specific battery powered platforms. So, if I kind of elaborate this little bit in detail, the evolution of the electric architecture is actually at different levels now. From say level zero to level five, six. So if I just talk about the uh, motor and inverter, you have a separately mounted motor and a chassis mounted inverter, and you have a, a bolt-on motor, and you have a semi-integrated motor, again a chassis mounted inverter. The mechanically integrated motor, and then you finally land at a fully integrated motor. So, in short, from a functionally independent and decoupled components to a dependent but coupled, but finally arriving to an architecture where it will be functionally dependent and coupled. So, as we go through this architecture evolution, we would start seeing the performance of the overall system improve significantly. We talked about the competence for this. So, we need a three step of expertise to achieve the overall system efficiency. So, when we say three step, I'm referring to a component, a module, and a system expertise. So, at the component level, we are talking about design and engineering of uh, axle, gear, wall, style, shaft, simulation of, uh, uh, you know, the gears, loop flow, NV edge, strength, durability, etc., etc., manufacturing. Then we move on to the system level, the drivetrain system, where the design and engineering of motors, inverters, uh, actuators, uh, the component level integration, cooling systems. We, within the system, drivetrain system, we have the simulation of motors, inverter controls, and shifting, again, NVH thermal analysis. And then you have the system integration at the vehicle level with the battery specification, EMC testing, functional safety, system simulation, by the overall system performance. So if I talk about a specific application in off highway, uh, for example, uh, uh, mobile elevated work platform, the expectations in terms of features and performances are should have advanced mechatronic capabilities, electronic differential and torque vectoring control, stability control system, to monitor the weight distribution, reduce power loss, improve traction and stability. And because it's it operates at an elevated level, uh, control to automatically limit and stop movements to prevent tip over incidents. Of course, improved efficiency for longer duty cycle times. So the the expectations in terms of performance is going to be actually even more 
when it comes to electric vehicles. So in summary, if I look at it, with electrification, there are a lot of opportunities to reshape the way power is delivered, whether it is uh, traction or work functions. And there are many different solutions that can be proposed to address the system requirements of electrification from low tech to high tech. And these solutions can be very innovative even when based on existing components because the design of the entire system can be optimized, let's say, for example, for efficiency. So a smart integration and controls can actually make the difference between good and bad solutions, even when based on the same base components. So with that, I will close my short speech, and I wish the student community all the very best and enjoy the innovation journey. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Manasini Rath, uh, Senior Vice President and Global Head for ADAS Autonomous Diving and few other business. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the autonomous driving, which is the current uh, and latest trend in the automotive. So as all of you know, autonomous driving has been there from last 10 years and all the engineering research, innovation, development, investment, everything is happening in this direction. And the more important reason why the whole automotive world is investing is to assure safety to the road drivers. So let's see uh, what you like to know more about uh, the technology, the challenges, and the current status of autonomous driving here. Before I go very deep, I would like to share a small video. So as you can see in this video, it just gives you what all safety are covered in the ADAS and autonomous driving today. So starting from pedestrian detection, as you saw, taking the intelligent decision on the traffic light, all the traffic conditions, understanding the traffic light situation and make the maneuver, all these activities done by the vehicle itself. There is no manual interventions. So that is what we are talking about in the Arbats driver safety system, which I am calling ADAS and the autonomous driving. Now, what is it really contents? The autonomous driving has five labels of driving. So it starts with the advanced driver assist system, which is at label 01. And in this label, this provides basic safety to the driver. What does that mean is by taking the judgment about the external environment, which happens through a set of sensors, which are mounted in the vehicle. These Sensors are camera, radar, and leader. The vehicle take a judgment of where the vehicle is and what will be the maneuvering decision. So in the ADAS system, the lower label safety, it provides some indication and provides assistance to the driver to take the right decision. So at ADAS label, label 0 and 1, the driver is fully in control of the steering and braking himself. As we go to the higher autonomy label, which is two, three, there the driver's intervention starts reducing. The amount of time that the driver put his hands on the steering and controls the steering as well as braking 
reduces as we go to the higher level of autonomy. So, in the autonomy level 2 and 3, the system, which is the ADAS and autonomous engineering solution, provides more and more autonomy and autonomous systems, like the steering is run on its own. So, the features we call uh, very familiar today, the adaptive cruise control SEC or advanced braking system AEB and all of that, where the vehicle itself is providing the auto automatic steering movement and automatic braking systems. Then we go to the higher autonomy, which is level four and ultimately level five, which is just a recommendation today in the market. It has has not been implemented yet. In label 4, it is almost the driver is completely hands-free from the steering and no braking system is applied by the driver. It's all done by the system. So the driver can read a book or can engage in doing something while the vehicle drives on its own. And in label 5, it almost there is no steering and braking system in the vehicle. The whole vehicle can be used as a conference uh, environment where people can do some work while driving. So level four and level five is the future. Now, why all these systems are extremely critical today? The data that we have so far from last 25 years from the accident in Europe, in US and all the advanced countries, more than 80% of the accident which has happened, which has taken people's life while driving, has been done because of the mistakes that the driver has done while driving. So the idea is when a system has been built with artificial intelligence and more learning system, the probability of such mistake will be significantly reduced and thereby saving a lot of lives. So the advantage of this autonomous driving systems are the reduction of the deaths out of the traffic, improving the utilization of the vehicle on the road and giving a better lifestyle while you drive for long hours, you can be able to make use of that time for something else, for business or for your family time while the vehicle drives on its own. Now, we will just see what has been achieved so far. As I said, personally, I have been involved in the ADAS and autonomous system since 2004 and 2005. So it is 13, 14, 15 years old. Now, it started defining what would be autonomous system, how a car will drive on its own in 2004 and five then there are list of features, as you see on the screen, has been defined to provide driver assistance system, which will automatically lead to autonomous system. So as I mentioned earlier also, the driver's eyes, ears, and the senses that a manual driver has is being replaced by the sensors in a ADAS and autonomous system. And those system, those sensors are camera, leader and radar. There are some features like rear camera features which are mostly helping in while reverse parking or avoiding the reverse collision. The other features are say the parking sensors indication, blind spot monitoring in the sense while you are driving through your rear mirror if you are not able to have the complete view there are blind spots how do this system provide you assistance for the blind system? Then there is front crash, lane departure warning. If you want to change from one lane to other lane, it gives you a warning. And then to the higher level where the AEB, the autonomous braking and adaptive cruise control is being implemented. And the graph shows you from 2005 the journey has started and in 2020, almost more than 40-45% of few features are on the road. What does that mean? Most of the car makers and OEMs 
have implemented these features already in the vehicles. Now the green bars give you an indication that by 2026, these features will be in most of the vehicles across the globe. And as you see, it is almost touching 70% of the coverage or 60% of the coverage of ADAS features like rear camera application or parking application. However, almost 50% will be implemented with the other safety front camera functions like blind, like the front crash, lane departure warning or autonomous braking and uh, uh, adaptive cruise control. So it is not any more theory. It is already in the vehicles and providing lots of benefit to the users. As I touched about the benefit, here is your statistics also you can see. So in the implementation of ADA so far in last say seven, eight years, the data shows between 2011 to 2015 and also later, the forward collision prevention, the lane keep assistance or detection of pedestrian and applying the brake when there is a pedestrian or the rear automotive braking, right? When you are parking or moving the back side, rear side, there might be collision. So these are kind of ADAS features which have been implemented. And this data shows the green portion and the blue portion that 62% of the crashes which would have happened due to the manual drive have been mitigated by implementing the ADAS system in the vehicle. The same way on the right side, it shows that the collision mitigation and saving the life of the driver also has been around 60 to 62%. So it is a reality, the ADAS is helping the assuring highest level of safety in the vehicle by saving lives in most of the crash situation, either front or rear. Now, you know what is the ADAS and autonomous system. You know what are the sensor used, then the central computing system, where all these features, the features that I talked about, the automatic braking or automatic steering or lane departure runs, which provides automatic steering movement or application of braking where the driver is just being assisted. Also, it provides warning if there is a possibility of collision or if there is another vehicle or object in the blind spot. So the system are the combination of the sensors and a central computing system where all these features run. So as you know about the engineering, you have seen why it has an autonomous system. You have also seen the benefits that it is providing to assure the safety of a life of a driver. Now for you, what is most important to understand is what are the engineering challenges so that you will be able to focus on few of these areas and would be able to contribute to this journey, which will really assure safety to all of us. So first and foremost challenge today is the maturity of the higher autonomy feature. As I explained, as we go to higher autonomy of level three, four, and five, we have to completely depend on the system to drive the vehicle. So today, whatever feature has are developed using the artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and so on and so forth, they are not fully matured to completely have the trust of 100%. So there are challenges in taking the AI and the, the deep learning to an embedded platform, the central computing that I talked about. So that is why the maturity of the features are a big challenge. And the maturity depends on how much of the road data we have created as a learning environment so that the artificial intelligence and the deep learning modules learn them and become mature. So these two challenges go in hand 
then the challenges come of the computing platform. As you all know, in the engineering, the artificial intelligence and machine learning, deep learning modules consume extremely high computing power and memory. So the today, whatever the silicon on chips are available and the memory silicons are available are a challenge to run these algorithm to its full optimum performance. Other than that, the steering and braking system in a vehicle are also uh, not being fully matured to automatically do the actuation, do the steering and brake. The challenge is in the response time as well as redundancy. So this is another key area where how do we improve the steering system, the braking system, so that they also respond as per the response time required by the autonomous driving. So that is a new research area where a lot of work is going on and some of you who are interested in actuation related computing, actuation related algorithm and feature development can focus on these challenges. Finally, to make any of the software application like ADAS or Autonomous to run on an embedded computing platform, you need a layer of software called middleware or basic software. This is the layer which actually communicates with the hardware and the computing platform so and the application so that the application runs at a speed that is desired. And as you can imagine, at what speed our brain runs. When we are driving, we are assessing and perceiving the situation. If there is a vehicle on the right, on the left or in the front, and we are taking decisions in micro microsecond to put, put the steering and braking. So finally, this application have to run at that speed to make the vehicle in control. And therefore, these middlewares have to enable that speed and performance to move the application to run the hardware and do the actuation. So ultimately, these are all the engineering challenge areas at a very high level. Please be engaged with us and understand more details on each of the area. And those who are interested to contribute to the, to assure safety on the road can pick up one of these area and do the research and uh, work with us to make the autonomous driving fully autonomous sooner and faster. Thank you. Hello friends, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to this uh, Tech Talk for Sparkle 2023. Uh, I'm sure you've been eagerly looking forward to Sparkle as usual, all the students do every year. I think it is India's one of the largest platform uh, uh, to let uh, young students like you to participate and bring their ideas uh, to the fruition. Um, we of course give multiple themes or which uh, students can build up uh, projects. And it is always heartening to see uh, fantastic ideas and concepts that students build around that. Uh, so welcome uh, to the event once again. And uh, it's my pleasure to interact with you uh, on this occasion. Uh, if I if I look back, uh, I, I mean, uh, way, way back, I was also an, an engineering student, just as many of you are. And uh, I remember my uh, uh, engineering project, and it was thoroughly exciting where uh, we actually ended up building some very interesting concept of, uh, of a pneumatic uh, press, uh, which had uh, pneumatic logic, which has a which had a circuit design out of pneumatic logic gates. Some of you who are probably electronics engineers or computer engineers, or probably most of you would know about logic gates. But what we did back then was build a circuit using pneumatic uh, valves, and you know, com uh, build a complete logic gates based circuit to make sure that. Uh, the machine can be operated only when both the hands are pressing the buttons just as a safety features. So it just brought me back the memories of uh, those days and very interesting to see what you guys uh, are bringing up here. 
with that i'll dive into the subject today um uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in the mobility space specifically from uh, software architecture perspective as most of you may have heard uh, there is a term now everybody is referring to uh, cars uh, whether it is a car or truck whatever as a software defined vehicle and uh, as the name suggests uh, the differentiation is happening uh, out of the software and it is no more about with just the mechanical part or just the electrical part right the software is increasingly playing a critical role uh, into how you and me experience the car and you know it is also starting to dictate the choices that we make based on the software content that we will see in the car so i'm going to take you a little bit through why this is the case uh, how we reached here uh, what is the current state of the art and and what's kind of coming uh, down the pike so to speak and what does it mean to you uh, uh, you know young students uh, like you um, um uh, who are kind of stepping into this exciting technology world uh, so let's go back a little bit and you know if you uh, if you remember this um uh, during probably your first year second year engineering especially those who are doing mechanical engineering uh, this is where it started right you know uh, the first kind of uh, internal combustion engine uh, uh, where there were a lot of mechanical parts the fuel injection was controlled mechanically uh, the combustion the when does the spark occur uh, was uh, controlled mechanically and opening of different valves etc and then it kind of kept on going for many many years this was like state of the art but uh, as you can see um, um, and we are st- the, the work is still not done right you know the the problems arising out of emission the regulatory aspects related safety aspects of course the fuel efficiency um while these systems were state of the art then i think they were probably still not the best when you look at the systems out there today um so what why that is the case right? and what what changed so to speak um as you can easily imagine i think uh, uh, the mechanical systems they kind of reached uh, their limits of efficiency you know, or how much of efficiency gain they can bring to the table and how much of improvements they can bring in terms of the features in terms of the experience etc uh, and that is where the electronically controlled systems started taking over and that is where the software kind of made its inroads so to speak into the cars into the vehicles um so uh, compliance to the regulatory aspect the safety aspects efficiency and overall appeal of the car is what drew uh, you know transition to from a purely mechanical systems to electromechanical systems and now increasingly electronic and software controlled uh, systems so that's that's how the journey uh, has been of course this journey uh, uh, was made possible uh, because of lot of underlying technology changes especially happening on the side of uh, um, uh, electronics and especially the digital circuitry and we'll take a quick uh, look at what are those changes and you know how those changes enable uh, to to reach where we are uh, today um so again here if you go back what you see at the bottom is one of the earliest transistors back in 1950s um which was just a unitary simple very very simple transistors and then we had uh kind of a TTL logic based quad gate somewhere in 1960s uh, made out of maybe just 16 transistors and it kind of kept on uh, growing from there right so few things like you know advancements in the digital circuitry advancements in the miniaturization of uh, transistor design on um, uh, the material sciences uh, manufacturing technologies uh, you know all of all that kind of confluence uh, led to smaller and smaller and smaller devices so to speak what we are seeing on the top is similar transistors but which was probably what is called as a valve in the good old days right but rapidly it got replaced with solid state uh, 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 semiconductor devices which also got miniaturized rapidly so starting within the span of 50 years as you can see when by the time we reach 2000 what started as maybe few tens of transistors we are not talking about as good as 592 million transistors in a modern 62 bit uh, microprocessor and that's the kind of you know mind blowing uh, advancement that has happened and i'm sure you would have heard about the moore's law right you know that is driving this um so obviously this this kind of drove a lot of innovation this kind of drove bringing in a lot many new features uh, inside the cars um, um and if you remember in our earlier days uh, you had a radio in the car right that is where another dimension from where the electronics entered into the cars you know you could tune to your, your station and listen to the radio then came the cassette players then came the cd players and then usb and then we are going towards uh, you know 
probably we are now already starting to look at how do you connect your smartphone and or probably even a built-in uh, internet connection using which you could enjoy your favorite music service subscription uh, right inside your car, right? And, you know, that has been another dimension through which a lot of experiential changes has happened. Um, it has also led to refinement of engines, meeting the emission control, uh, overall what is what can be called as traction control to make the car safer. So, for example, when you apply brakes to make sure that the car stops within the safe distance and time, there's a lot of sensor actuator and circuitry that goes behind, which is a software controlled aspect and, and, and many more things. So, obviously, as you can Im imagine, more and more and more features um, were electronically controlled, so to speak, or electronic software combination, so to speak, against mechanical system. And, uh, and as you can imagine, uh, each of these functions is controlled by what is called as an electronic control unit. Um, uh, and But with this explosion, I think the modern car is now a very complex uh, machine uh, which is comprising of many, many electronic control units, each managing a different function. So, as you can see, it is pretty complex already inside a car. Like, you have an advanced uh, driver assistance systems like, you know, cruise control system. What is cruise control is basically, imagine that you're driving on a highway. Um, and the highway is probably not so thickly populated. So you could push the cruise control button in the car and the car will keep maintaining its speed, right? Um, um, and you don't have to push your, uh, keep. you don't need to keep your foot on the pedal. Very, very nice feature. Then it went to adaptive cruise, cruise control. Adaptive in the sense, if there is a car in front, your car will slow down and again catch up the required speed. Then lane keep assist. And now we are talking about autonomous car and I'm sure you would have heard about it. At the same time, while, uh, uh, you know, software and electronics did great job in improving the fuel efficiency, now we are also moving towards electric, fully electric cars, right? So, and then how do you experience everything inside of the car, the lighting, uh, the remote lock, uh, the security features, the park assist features. So as you can see, there is an electronic control unit for everything. So this is happening on one hand side. As you can imagine, the software content rapidly grew. Um, and so did the complexity, right? the many, many wires, different types of connectivity interfaces inside of the car. Like we have Ethernet in an enterprise network, the cars have a special network. You know, Of course, now the cars also have Ethernet, but there is also something called as a controller area network. There is a flex ring, there is lean. These are typically typical automotive buses to fulfill the needs of the sensor actuator that we have in the car. With that, what is happening is all our life cycle, our lifestyle is rapidly changing, right? You know, it's a highly digital connected lifestyle that all of us live today, you know. Everything is kind of around the smartphone and, you know, you use your smartphone in unimaginable ways today from making your payments to navigation to making calls to video calls and whatnot, right? So, a lot of things are kind of uh, getting bent around uh, the smartphone, so to speak. Uh, and obviously, in therefore, the today's uh, connected uh, digital life cycle age, uh, we are experiencing or we want to experience our vehicles, our cars very, very differently than, you know, what the, it, it, you, it earlier used to be. Um, let's look at what does it really mean, right? You know, in terms of user uh, persona, persona. So we now expect our car to serve us many, many different services, right? So you could imagine your day split into different parts of the time, you know, time that you spend to go to work, uh, the time that you spend with your family, um, the time you coming back, how do you communicate? How do you uh, how do you connect with each other? Um, you know how do you reach to a destination? As you can see, there are many many different services which are relevant to different aspects of your experience with the car, right? And that is what has been rapidly also driving the change now from a software perspective. And as you can imagine, many of these features are highly digital. Many of these features are connected and cloud based, right? Which makes things very interesting. Uh, and and just just to take a, 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 a glimpse of that, right? So what you see on the left hand side, everything which is inside of the car, which is an in vehicle world, and what you see on the right hand side, everything is on the digital side, the digital world, right? Your e-commerce, your weather service, you know, gamification, digital payments, booking restaurants, whatnot. And what you can see at the bottom, the features which were earlier native features which were inside of the car are now increasingly becoming connected cloud-based features. So the boundaries are kind of uh, blurring. Alongs all this was while happening, you know, alongside kind of came, came someone like Tesla, which completely, you know, changed uh, and, you know, uh, you know, caught people by 
uh, imagination that what you can basically do by software and you know cloud and car integration so to speak so now what everybody is looking at is while there are complex sensors available advanced sensors available in the car like you have a very accurate gps sensor you have very accurate sensors to probably detect the road surface uh, you have got cameras now you'll have radars and leaders for autonomous driving cars uh, you know car is basically loaded with sensors so now car makers are looking at how can they build new digital services by combining these sensors and bring those interesting services to you and me and continue to provide refresh experience even after the car is sold but that is where lies the complexity right what is happening is with all of these enhancements uh, advancements the amount of software inside the car is growing by leaps and bounds you know a today's car a modern car is anywhere uh, expected to have like 100 million lines of code and with autonomous driving it is expected to go to as high as 300 million lines of code and that's a lot of software as you can easily imagine uh, and if you recall the earlier picture how do you now manage such a large piece of software and how do you update or refresh this software right? and that's where that that is what triggers yet another challenge um uh, because all of all of you update your smartphones every now and then right and uh, sometimes the smartphone update fails you restart you're okay with that now imagine the same thing happening to your car right you simply cannot you'll simply not accept the update failing in the car and your car stopping in the middle of the road that is number one number two with such a large piece of software and if you have to update that software it takes several hours uh, to update the car because if you imagine if you remember what i mentioned is while we have ethernet we will have we also have some very automotive specific network architecture like something like can control area network which is a very low speed network it could be like 2 mbps maybe 8 mbps and, and of course that is also a, a improving rapidly but still that is nothing compared to 100 mbps ethernet pipe right so the time taken to update all the electronic control units is increasing rapidly the complexity of update is increasing rapidly so on one hand side you have a situation that the software content is increasing the software is key to give new experiences uh, software is critical to bring uh, a, a newer way newer digital service to consumers like us uh, and we want that we expect that but the existing architecture is limiting that right that is where everything is shifting to what we call as software defined vehicles and the related middleware in order to kind of enable uh, those kind of things to kind of make happen so let's take a quick look at how does it look like right so uh, the ee architecture which is basically electronic electrical and electronic architecture inside the car is therefore rapidly changing what you see on the extreme left is a typical earlier generation car where you have many 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 control units are uh, distributed all over the car connected by different types of bus architecture uh, and then what what that is moving to what we call cal call and now as a central compute plus zonal architecture the basic idea is this if a if a software feature needs to change how do i get, create an ability so that i can change only one feature and not the entire stack of the software how do i uh, uh, how do i kind of make sure that i'm able to do it as fast as possible in a matter of weeks and in a modular manner at the same time as you can imagine the control software that is controlling let's say sensors and actuators like you know sensing that a brake pedal has been pushed and taking an action on that uh, accelerator etc the software that senses the data from the reads the data from sensors and the software that drives certain actuator so to speak like what is meant by driving an actuator applying a brake so there is a sensor that senses the brake is pressed there is a software algorithm or a control loop uh, that detects how the brake has been pressed and says that this is how the brakes have to be applied and there is a software piece that drives the actuator which could be a solenoid or anything electromechanically or electromagnetic system which will actually apply the brake right so that's a typical control loop uh, so the as you can imagine the sensors and actuators don't change that rapidly right and that software does not change rapidly because it is related to the physics of the sensor and actuator but what changes is the high level experience that you and me want to see out of it imagine a battery operated vehicle when you push the accelerator pedal um, in a battery operated vehicle how fast should it accelerate should it accelerate the same way when you are going uphill or downhill should it accelerate the same way when the battery is fully charged or not fully charged there are now so many variables right and and or you want to have a sport mode or a leisure mode etc now as you can imagine in a battery vehicle all of this can be very easy to software control so the 
let's call it a supervisory software piece of software that can control this can change or may have to change faster than the actual piece of software which is actually managing the batteries and the motor and stuff like that so that software is getting moved to what we call as a high performance vehicle computer which is expected to change much more faster than the software that is probably going to sit closer to the sensors on actuator and that is where it brings us to why this is critical because the fundamental ability is can i update the software faster can i update the features on demand and that is driving the whole innovation um so what does it mean is yes you need a new electrical architecture as i showed on the last slide but you also need uh, a software stack uh, that will support all of this right and this is what it kind of means uh, for all of you so if you now open up a modern computer inside of the car largely you can say that the software will be divided into these three blocks the base software so called middleware or a car operating system and the vehicle applications uh, don't get confused by the word car operating system it is not the operating system in the sense linux is or windows is it is more like a, a layer of functionality that provides the car specific functionality to the higher level see in a seamless manner um so what we have is these three layers and as you can imagine each of these three layers drives certain distinct functionality for example base software is typically focused on the operating system uh, uh you know enabling uh, you know the hardware software integration extracting the highest possible performance from the hardware for example in the modern hardware you also have neural network accelerators you have image accelerators graphics accelerators um uh, uh, 3d graphics accelerators so how do you use that right so that is what the that is what is about hardware software integration then we are talking about high speed networking high speed ethernet how do you transfer the data from point a to point b um how do you maintain the security when you are doing all of that right so all of those typical aspect you will be you will be able to touch upon all of those aspects if you were kind of working on the base software and obviously from a technology perspective it is going to typically linux or qnx or some other equivalent post six operating system in terms of skills it could be like oh you know if you are passionate about hardware software you know how do you write device drivers how do you tune the kernel the operating system kernel uh the advanced security technologies like intrusion detection uh hardware accelerated security architectures um and there are many many different paradigms there so any any of you who are passionate about hardware hardware software integration and low level software this is the place for you um then comes the middleware layer right and the middleware comprises of multiple different services and i don't want to kind of get into details of that so that not to over complicate it but you can imagine that it is made up of different supplementary services like service to update the software of the car itself uh, a service to maintain the security monitoring a uh, service for let's say um uh, monitoring that all the nodes inside the car are functioning properly service to diagnose the car software itself should something go wrong so on and so forth right so now this is rapidly moving to service oriented architecture like some of you may have heard about com decom or corba so the concepts from an it side what we had for the service oriented architecture are now entering cars and then obviously the software itself is highly distributed software we're talking about using technologies like containerization and remote software update so any one of you who kind of are familiar with dockers now we are getting use we are starting to use dockers inside the car or equivalent technologies like kubernetes uh, we're talking about cloud connectivity https mqtt what have you right so you know because the boundaries are rapidly blurring and obviously programming itself is rapidly moving from plain c to c++ and even modern languages like python and rust so it is like an amalgamation of all of that so if you are somebody who enjoys the software architecture and distributed system managing that uh, and is passionate about all of these aspects i think this is this is the right place for you and then come the actual applications right which are which are kind of uh, will be seen by you and as you can see Uh, from an innovation perspective the applications will be straight into autonomous driving electrification digital services or in vehicle commerce right kind of these these kind of uh, uh, buckets so let's 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 kind of put all of together right so to summarize as i said um, the modern architecture is changing it is having an exciting combination of high speed ethernet on one side and earlier uh, architecture on other side it is increasingly driven by extremely powerful socs or microprocessors like qualcomm 
uh, NXP, TIs of the world. Uh, so we are talking about multi-core, like eight-core, twelve-core based SOCs with graphics acceleration, neural network acceleration. We are talking about advanced uh, operating systems like Linux. Uh, we are talking about advanced cloud technologies coming to the car and a seamless cloud to car integration. Right? So it's a it's a very very interesting mix, and 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 therefore the because those boundaries are blurring. Anybody who understands these layers or anybody can move across these layers will thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy this as against, let's say, just writing, let's say, a control software on one hand side or just writing a cloud software on the other hand side. Now you kind of have an opportunity to connect all the dots and, you know, bring the best of each of these. So uh, to summarize, uh, I mean, are you ready for, ready for this enjoy ride? And it's a, it's a thoroughly, thoroughly um, enjoyable joy ride. I can personally tell from my experience, uh, I've been with KPID since about 23 and a half years. So I joined as a C++ developer, but then I'm working on this stack where I'm juggling with all these technological aspects. I'm looking at performance on one hand side, security on the other hand side, network connectivity on the other hand side, and it just keeps getting more and more and more exciting. So if any of these terms excite you, Linux, DevOps, CICD, 5G, uh, machine learning, OpenGL, um, CarPlay, uh, Android, iOS itself, I think the next generation car architecture and the software-defined vehicles is the place for you. So I, I, I invite you uh, to this journey. And as you can imagine, KPIT is a leading player in this area. We are working with the best in the world. Uh, you would have seen some announcement from the public domain in the past. We have worked with uh, uh, BMW um, uh, uh, and the likes. And then there are many more announcements out there. You can go look that up. So KPIT is one of the largest independent software and solution uh, uh, partner to this overall ecosystem and um, if if these technologies would excite you i think this is the right place for you to kind of uh, kind of jump start um, your your journey towards mobility and again lastly we are doing this because we are committed to mobility and where we, we are very passionate about you know through the mobility you know making this world a better and safer place a cleaner place you know that's our that's our vision so i i you know, invite all of you to this joy right and all the best i have Thank you. I am Pradeep Chandrasekharan uh, from Ola Electric Technologies, also a management committee member from SA India Southern Section. So. Uh, for next few minutes, we are going to have a quick chat or update on the fuel solutions for transportation uh, and for future mobility. So, uh, everybody know we have been studying about hydrogen from the spooling, right? Is it not? Uh, the thing is, uh, everybody know hydrogen is one of the, I would say, uh, element which is the lightest and is abundant in our environment. Right, but uh, many people don't know in depth that it is one of the very very lucrative uh, alternate fuel, uh, which can replace many of the contemporary fuels in the uh, global scenario now. Why? The reason being H two is uh, abundant. That means the sun comprises of ninety two percentage of hydrogen by mass. About ten percentage of human body mass is hydrogen. Do you know the energy in 2.2 pounds, that is 1 kilogram of hydrogen gas, is about the same as that of energy in 1 gallon, that is 6.2 pounds of gasoline. So, these are interesting, is it not? And also, hydrogen is 75 percentage of element mass in universe. Uh, so, these are some of the uh, interesting facts which makes it as a viable option. Uh, there are two graphs depicted here. If you see on the left hand side table, you see the figures of hydrogen demand from 2015 to 2050 projected. So if you see in 2015, it's more focused on a uh, new feedstock and a few on the energy from the industry side. And if you see, there is a, uh, a thin line starting from 2020 and the thickness or the height of the line goes on increasing from 2030, 2040 and 2050. So by 2050, I would say out of the 100 percentage, maybe one by fourth is going to be in the transportation. So such is the huge demand or potential being seen for hydrogen. 
and in the right hand side graph shows very clear contribution of reduction in CO2 emissions which can be done by going towards hydrogen and that projection is that uh, nearly 6 gigaton can be reduced of CO2 emissions by 2050. So this is one fact. What are the other interfaces for hydrogen? So if you see hydrogen, uh, it is uh, having interface on the chemical. That means it is being uh, deployed for cosmetics, food processing, ammonia production, electronics, uh, methanol, etc, etc. Fuel, we have already seen. It's also used in for the natural gas, like steam, methane, reforming, then renewable sources. So here we talk of one uh, interesting fact called CHP, that is combined heat and power, where the hydrogen or the fuel cell augment itself with the other renewable sources, which we are going to see today. And also, of course, carbon and the coal, uh, whatever the uh, extraction process and everything. But what is the challenge? The hydrogen is simple. At the same time, it is the lightest gas in the universe. So what is the implication? So a volume of around 11 meter cube of uh, the gas, which is uh, uh, nearly the volume of a trunk, is needed to store just 1 kg of hydrogen. So And this will be required to drive nearly 100 kilometers. So such is the huge volumetric requirement. Uh, because of this, there is a demand for storing and transporting the hydrogen in different forms. We go for either high pressure storage, very low temperature or a hybrid storage. So one of the form where hydrogen is explicitly used is the fuel cell. So how the fuel cell work? In a very, very simple term. There is an anode, there is a cathode. You pump in hydrogen at the anode and you pump in air with oxygen in the cathode. What and there is a uh, what to say a guy who interfaces that is the membrane. So when the hydrogen is pumped because of the chemical reaction, the electrons are stripped from the hydrogen atoms. So the protons travel from anode to cathode and mixes with the oxygen and uh, gets out as water. Whereas the electrons travel in the circuit through the load and gives a charge. So this is a simple principle and how the hydrogen is being employed. So this is nothing but the hydrogen rainbow. Yeah, hydrogen is not a simple that only one form. It has different colors. Like we have seven colors, we have five colors of hydrogen. It starts from the level of purity. The lowest being the blue, then black, gray, brown, and the green. So as the color indicates, it's very clear that green is completely green. We are getting this from the electrolysis process of water that is splitting off uh, oxygen and hydrogen. And the blue is completely from under the air, which gets uh, during the extraction process. I talked about the characteristics of hydrogen. This is depicted in the form of a very beautiful graph. So there are two parameters. One is the gravimetric density and another is the volumetric. So when we say volumetric, it's nothing but mega joule per liter. And gravimetric is mega joule per kg, that is weight. So if you see the volumetric density, Right In the volumetric density, uh, you see uh, diesel, gasoline are having the highest, that is around, uh, what to say, 30 or uh, 35 like that. Whereas if you see hydrogen, whether it is liquefied or, or uh, pressurized, it's having only 3 or 2. So this is one of the reasons why we have to go for a bigger storage. And when we see the gravimetric density, here it is interesting that the diesel or gasoline has only around 20 to 22, this band, right? Even ethanol, methanol, all these guys lie here. Whereas if you go for hydrogen, it's completely around 120, 122. So the energy content by weight is nearly 3.5 to 4 times of that of the conventional fuel, which is the thumbs up for the hydrogen. So considering all these things, we have to go for a challenge in handling. So how are we handling? in the transportation. So one is a physical based, another is a material based. Uh, interesting is a material based because in the material base we go for either in the form of adsorbent, uh, liquid organic, interstitial hydrates, complex hydrates and chemical hydrogen. As the name indicates or the uh, image is indicating, in adsorbent the hydrogen is um, stored in the surface of the matrix so during the requirement of hydrogen, it is deprived, that is, it is a dehydrogenation which takes place and it is taken out. 
in liquid organic it is we call it as LOHC in the next slide it's that in the interstitial hydrates these are impregnated in the lattice structures so the green are nothing but the hydrogen between the different atoms so do, it is taken out by a dehydrogenization uh, process from that it is hydrogen is extracted and complex hydride it is the same so all these three only differs from the way of chemical which is taking the hydrogen and the last is the, of course the chemical hydrogen so here there are few elements which have good affinity with the hydrogen one is boron and another is nitrogen so we have it in the converted form either in form of boron hydride or in form in the form of ammonia the next interesting thing is the physical base yes we are going for a compressed gas storage cryo compressed or liquid so what are those things we'll just see i have just depicted a small uh, simple figure uh, this is a Doosan make hydrogen tank uh, which is a uh, different type i'll explain here so this is how a tank looks like you have two cups uh, the cup can be either metal or uh, plastic uh, I, I would say a composite reinforced uh, fiber and the metal uh, internal structure and you have a receptacle and you have the valve so there are four types of uh, storage type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 in type 1 the cylinder is completely metallic in type 2 you have a liner metal and the uh, outside is a composite and in type 3 you have internally metal and you have outside as a composite type 4 is a very important you have completely liner also polymer and all the junction and joiner is also fiber plus resin and you have only the metallic bars to which the regulator valve is connected so the world is working towards type 3 or type 4 because of its lightweight handling and other technology wise okay so hydrogen uh, we spoke about is finding application in fuel cell we talked about what is fuel cell so what are the types of fuel cell basically the fuel cell differs in the form by virtue of anode cathode electrolyte and the temperature of operation what is so if you see uh, it starts from simple that is proton exchange membrane pem then you go for alkaline and then it goes for solid oxide what is the difference so you see the differences in the anode so if up to uh, phosphoric acid it's completely only direct hydrogen whereas uh, cathode gas is atmospheric oxygen when you go for higher temperature you go for alternate materials either it can be a methane or it can be a natural gas and you see the efficiency is also increasing we go from 35 percentage up to 60 to 65 but the notable thing here is the temperature of operation so for normal thing we go for either AFC or a PEM where you go for 70 to 80 whereas if you go for solid oxide based on the requirement it goes up to 1000 degrees centigrade uh, the same thing is depicted here uh, it seems that the high temperature uh, is indicated for SOFC and uh, lower temperature is for uh, AFC and uh, one more thing there are bi components which are uh, happening uh, as a result of electrochemical reaction at anode and uh, cathode which is also given by virtue of the temperature of operation SOFC mostly operates on constant load condition whereas AFC so DMFC it operates on variable load condition so this is a uh, basic architecture I would say for the fuel cell so when we talk about PEM uh, proton exchange membrane and there uh, as I explained this is integrated with the combined heat and power unit so if you see this uh, layout uh, the gas is pumped from here then there is a controller desulfurizer uh, then there are valves it goes into the reformer from the reformer uh, with other high voltage system controls and everything it, it is fed into the LD PEM st uh, stack so there are three stacks which are combined together to make one module uh, in the same manner uh, air is uh, pressurized from here with the help of uh, combustion air blower and it also goes through a lot of uh, refinements before it reaches the significance of uh, the CHP system is whatever the heat is coming out it is recovered and it is converted for other applications number one also uh, this supplies the power for operating the complete system and this type of application this circuit is used for standalone energy system this is not for a mobile system so we saw about PEM now this is a SOFC which is at very high temperature so here it's going to be 
um, natural gas, which will be the input. Then you have the startup fuel bypass. Then you have a combustor, then reformer. Then you get into the start. And again, in a similar manner, it has the CHP. Like I told, the major difference is uh, only in handling the temperature, gas, and what is the type of input and the control system. And SOFC is having a more complex control system and it is more having high efficiency. Okay, so we saw what is a uh, architecture. Now uh, let us understand what is the cost percentage of each of these items. So if you see first at the stack, so uh, and second at the stack system cost. So if you see the stack system itself, the majority of the cost, roughly more than 50 percentage is coming from the stack. Stack is nothing but the module or a series of modules of fuel cell. All other sublimitary systems, for example, there is a thermal management, there is a air management. These are next level contributors. Now, when you get into the stack system, the major contributor is from electrodes. Electrodes, that is anode and the cathode. And next comes the bipolar plate, which is nothing but a, um, I would say a catalyst which favors the passage of, uh, I would say, ions from anode to cathode and vice versa. So these two take away two by third, I would say, uh, even more than that 75 percentage of the total cost. So this is a, based on a, one of the US data at the mass production level. Uh, this table compares about the energy storage system volume between the different uh, electrification options. For example, uh, this talks about with respect to the lead acid, uh, nickel metal hydride, then lithium ion, and our hydrogen tax. So if you carefully read this graph, uh, the x-axis had the range in terms of miles and uh, y it has the energy storage volume liters. So uh, in case of lead acid, both are uh, I would say not a very positive one. For a very high system volume, you are getting around 110 or 120 as a range. In a nickel metallic hydrate, it is further stretched for the same volume. You get a better range. And in lithium ion, still you are getting a better range. And in a fuel cell, uh, with the effective handling of hydrogen, uh, you are not going uh, beyond a certain volume. That means, you are able to manage within 350 volume. How you are asking means, this is the case with the, either you handle in terms of hydrates, solid components or in more compact lightweight tanks. So in this, there is an effective utilization of space and also you are getting a uh, better range. You are seeing around 375 to 380 miles of range. So effective Im implementation of technology, optimization of parameters is going to help in better implementation of fuel cell and hydrogen tanks. Uh, this is a very simple circuit on how the uh, fuel cells vehicles are architecture, vehicles, right? We saw standalone systems. So in the vehicle, you have the cylinders for storage, then you have the uh, fuel cell unit, then you have the power control, and uh, you have the uh, suction system for oxygen. So normally a vehicle operates on three modes. What are those initial start, then uh, braking, then acceleration. In the initial start, what it happens, it's a normal move from the, uh, I would say, uh, zero to a certain uh, level of power is required. So in that condition, the fuel cell itself generates its own power from the chemical reaction. During deceleration, what it happens, the motor acts as a generator. So the kinetic energy dissipated, it's given back to the motor, which converts that into the electrical energy and it gets stored into the battery. So it is in terms of the sublimented. Whereas the third is important, in the sudden acceleration, fuel cell only cannot uh, give the entire power. So it goes for in requirement of some sublimentary uh, accessories unit. So here what it happens when more power is required, the battery which is having some storage comes into picture and it or supplements the fuel cell. In a way, it gives more power. So this is what the fuel cell uh, operates with the uh, hydrogen unit inbuilt. So there should be some standards for all this fuel cell, is it not? You cannot have just a 
China is using some standard, India is using some standard, it should not, right? Like in EV, we have now got aligned with the international standards, whatever the Indian standards are at par with the regulations of uh, the uh, global standards. So for fuel cells also, these are some of the commonly available database. Uh, the SAE J series, this talks about the different aspects of fuel cells. Say for example, how do you install a tank? What are the things required for a peripheral thing? How do you measure the consumption? So, so that what you measure or the standard you refer in India, China, US or UK should be the same. So that this vehicle which will be made anywhere can go into the other country only in addition to that there will be uh, the country wise homologation be done. So these are some of the references. Uh, this is one interesting uh, I would say layout which I could refer from uh, public domain. Uh, a typical uh, electric uh, fuel cell architecture from Bosch. Uh, if you see that the same thing is replicated, uh, the green lines are nothing but the hydrogen flow lines and the central unit, this unit that is the number four unit is the fuel stack. You have the oxygen being pumped from here, then there is a compressor to pump in. This is a control unit and these are high voltage unit, these are controllers. There are going to be uh, uh, sensors, there will be temperature sensor, there will be pressure sensors and other control unit. So principle wise all the systems work in the same method and only the change will be with respect to chemical composition, quantity, temperature variation and other dimensional changes. Uh, this talks about the cost competitiveness trajectories. When I mean cost you see this uh, dotted lines. So these blue are transportation related application. So what is happening in 2020, we are not having too much of uh, application. This is a US data figure. It is implemented only in four clips. The dotted means that hydrogen is competitive in only optimal conditions. It is not in normal condition. Whereas a thick line indicates that it is more effective even in a normal operating condition. So, with this understanding, if you see, by 2022-23, uh, it is going to find more application in heavy duty trucks, M, uh, medium duty trucks, vans and other things. And after 2025, you see a complete uh, thick line. That means it is going to be effectively implemented for usage in normal conditions also. So this graph or this projection very clearly shows that hydrogen is going to, or I would say hydrogen with fuel cell is going to find a very deep route in the mobility in the years to come. And in the same manner, you find the bandwidth or usage on transportation is more compared to other heat and power for building than heat and power for industry or industry feedstock. So transportation and e-mobility will have a huge uh, requirement of hydrogen and fuel cell. So globally many things are happening. Let's see what we are doing in India. IOCL, you know, Indian Oil Corporation, they have rolled out, uh, they have a plan to roll out 50 hydrogen buses from their Haryana and Gujarat refineries. They are also having plans to work with the uh, uh, OEMs to make vehicles. And they also plan to uh, do subsidization of hydrogen prices so that it can be commercialized. Uh, last to last year in September 2020, Government of India through its Automotive Industry Standard uh, Steering Committee, they framed and implemented AS157. This standard clearly lists the safety and procedural requirements for the type of rule of hydrogen CVs. Then in 2019, Kunda India announced its efforts to assess the feasibility of hydrogen FCV like Nexo. Nexo is a popular uh, global selling model from Hyundai, which is a fuel cell vehicle. And a few more initiatives are already taken. Like in last budget, they gave uh, approval of 1500 crore for improving and increasing the uh, generation of hydrogen. And India has an ambitious goal of achieving 175 gigawatt by 2022 
uh, we know pandemic has hit it a uh, bit bad but still we are putting a lot of effort this is one of the low hanging fruit and the long term plan which is going to take us towards our commitment in paris agreement where india has also told by 2070 india will become pollution free the uh, emission of chg will be zero that means 50 years from now we have to achieve so this is uh, a one step leap in that uh, vision uh, this article you must have seen uh, just uh, in the month of uh, february 2022 uh, if i am not wrong exactly it was on 17th february a uh, government has come out with more clear cut initiative for the uh, manufacturing or installation of green hydrogen or green ammonia so few of the things i would like to yeah, you can google it in public domain also uh, government has announced that uh, whomsoever is setting up this project and getting it commissioned before 30th uh, june 2025 maybe you can say 3 and 1/2 years from now will get a waiver of interstate transmission charges for 25 years they need not provide any interstate transmission charges of power they will be given a benefit and incentive in the renewable purchase obligation which is a very good initiative and a motivating feature and they will be also favored in getting the lands for storage of this purpose in forms of either bunkers or in in terms of of uh, setting up uh, what to say handling units near the ports and uh, other than this there were many other things that were rolled out so clearly india is in the direction of national hydrogen mission which will also uh, get us to implementation of fuel cell so we saw that uh, hydrogen fully into fuel cell is it like hydrogen uh, can get implemented only through fuel cell which can uh, reduce our emission probably yes and probably not why i am telling this is hydrogen has a good characteristic that it can be mixed with other gas and there can be a hydrogen enriched cng which we are seeing on roads today yes there is a 4% more fuel economy with this uh, enrichment of hydrogen in cng these buses are flying successfully in the roads in delhi 50 cluster buses have been already deployed and the emission wise also there is a 70% reduction in especially the carbon monoxide emissions compared to a stand alone cng so these are some of the pics how this uh, buses are being codified and you see the uh, bar chart where it is clearly talking how much is the reduction even nox of condo and co is also come down very drastically so this is one way of implementation uh, globally there are many players i have taken few of the references so hyzon passenger so this they are operating many passenger coaches in netherland belgium and other european countries so this uh, vehicle uh, has a fuel power uh, of around 80 kilowatt continuous and it has an amount of hydrogen up to the tune of 35 kg working pressure is 350 bar other uh, dimensional details of this vehicles are given similar thing hyzon operates or has also a uh, class a uh, fuel cell electric truck this has a 110 kilowatt hour because of its uh, excess loading and here the amount of hydrogen is also uh, 50 to 70 kg and you see the working pressure is 350 bar while coming on the passenger car sides people like uh, hyundai toyota honda are much much ahead this uh, data what i have put here is 2015 data so if you see uh they are having around uh, the price tag of around 57000 to 65000 us dollar they have a range of around 500 to 600 km and the other uh, thing is they have even a volume production of you know, 2000 to 3000 uh, numbers even in 2016 2017 so these players have refined their products continuously throughout this years and they are also pioneers in pushing the technology across the globe so uh, we have seen all this what is fuel cell and etc etc now there are some key drivers what is making fuel cell a interesting or a, a preferable option in future so this uh, image gives you a very good uh, representation if you see the x axis gives the types of fuel the y axis gives the vehicle size so from the size of the vehicle maybe it is a passenger car short distance and other things we can go for a bev which is a battery electric vehicles 
if it is for a uh, high voltage plug in hybrids like uh, Toyota Prius or everything, we can go for in between because these will be hybrids. There will be definitely gasoline or diesel uh, fuel which is augmented by this and the long uh, distance vehicle that is a bus, there is a truck and other things we are going for definitely FCVs because of the potential of uh, fuel cell and the uh, accommodating character of hydrogen. The second driver is, uh, this I could pull out from one of the public domain. Uh, though EVs are very predominant, uh, they are having our concentration in few of the areas globally. You must be aware, but still, if you see copper, it's mostly concentrated in Chile and then few areas of African countries. If you see nickel, it's only, I, I would say, one by third is in Indonesia. If you see cobalt, which is very important for lithium-ion battery, it's in Congo, 69%, and China has most of the mines in Congo. So we have to be, I mean, dependent on uh, these countries. And even for rare earths, 60% is from China. For lithium, you find most of the reserves in Australia and Chile. And uh, even the processing of this clean energy materials are mostly handled in China. If you see almost everywhere, it is 50% plus. So this gives you an idea or a knowledge that yes, we have a supply today, but how far it will be sustainable, we need to see, we need to carefully watch, monitor, because one side we are saying it is a very good viable uh, solution, but the sustainability needs to be seen uh, from different political uh, pressures, diplomacy and other things. Uh, this is one of the other driver where in 2021, how much is the uh, investment of different countries? This uh, spider is giving that. So if you see, $266 billion was in invested by China and India is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th position. India has invested $14 billion uh, in 2021 and this is the bifurcation. So roughly $561 billion have been invested and India is around uh, I would say 2 percentage, whereas China is roughly around 36 percentage. So what it is signifying? The significance is, out of this maximum amount, there are further also addition than for total investment. So all put together, there is an investment of 754 billion done, out of which 76 percentage has been done only for electrifying the transport. And then, uh, sorry, uh, change change from 2020 to 2021, the growth has been 76 percentage on the your electrified transport. The next thing is hydrogen. You see the growth or the jump, 33 percent growth is there only on the hydrogen. So it's very clear to say we are looking for hydrogen as a, one of the future options. Uh, this is one more chart. Uh, this talks about uh, on based on the utilization of the vehicles and the average uh, miles they are traveling and the weight they are carrying, what uh, capacity of the fuel cell uh, units are being planned. Say for example, the simplest is the forklifts. Passenger car, it goes to up to, say, starts from 80 to 200. Then it goes to uh, low duty, medium duty, heavy duty and other things. So the interesting thing is, you see it's even in the trains and even in the ships. So we go for 60 megawatt and 3 to uh, or 2 to 3 megawatt. So everywhere there is a plan for deployment and the technology is uh, able to be implemented everywhere. Only the infrastructure to, should support along with the commercial viability. Uh, there are few more drivers, high demand for uh, fuel cells. Uh, like I have highlighted, vehicle emissions uh, account for around 15 percentage of global greenhouse emissions. Uh, there is a RNS demand, as I told, uh, for uh, heavy duty buses and trucks. There is a capacity requirement of greater than 250 kilowatt. And uh, European countries, they have targeted that it, they should have minimum of 30 percentage of new electric vehicle sales by 2030. This, this is very well uh, pointed out in that direction. Then there is a subsidy from government. Even in India, government is now subsidized for EVs. As you all know, there is uh, definitely a wavering of what is the registration and insurance and other things. Similarly, uh, the, all the 
governments like even Chinese government has given around uh, uh, 22,000 US dollar concession on the purchase of fuel cell uh, car and Chinese government want around a billion fuel cell electric cars by 2030. Uh, of course, the last one, the drive is a uh, European drive that is a high five, which talks about the creation and development of a hydrogen fueling station. And they have also made a clear cut plan projection, uh, hydrogen uh, capacity of uh, one kg or two kg or so. It's a very interesting, it's going to be soon commercialized and be available in the market. Uh, this is a YouTube video link. You can very well just Google it and check. Ha! Huh. So we are not far behind. So these two senior delegates, one Dr. Ram Kumar, Director IOCL, and Mr. Vaidya, they are riding hydrogen bicycle developed by IOCL. It's true. It's just 10-15 days back in the newspaper. So they are proud, and IOCL has been very, uh, very much instrumental and pioneering in this complete initiative. So, you can imagine, in bicycle itself, we are able to do, the days are not far for making it on the two-wheelers, three-wheelers, four-wheelers. Yes, there are challenges, but we can definitely mitigate that. So, uh, I have been talking about, but you might be wondering why. So, this uh, is one more interesting figure. If you see, this talks about the carbon cost of transportation, that is, what is a carbon footprint travel for different vehicles? You see, uh, flight is making the maximum carbon, uh, I would say, emission, that is 255 gram. Then comes the car, then comes the medium car flight, uh, medium haul flight, then long haul flight. The interesting feature is then comes the bus. It is not the small cars or, or the even the trains. So we have to cater to this category bus, uh, small cars and the electric application itself. So this is a very good potential area where fuel cell can be planned for implementation or thought of him or resolving all the challenges whereby we can bring down the carbon cost which is attributed in that operation. Uh, what are the recent research and trends that are happening global wise? Uh, there are uh, advances in fuel cells and electrolyzers, um, electrode materials are going for change, especially in the anion exchange membrane fuel cells. Then there are rethinking happening on the nanoparticles in energy materials, especially in the formation functionality. And the more uh, peculiar thing is that a lot of research is happening on the catalyst. As I told, 50% of the cost is from catalyst. So there are uh, novel ideas on oxygen reduction reaction catalyst, understanding the material structure, performance, interactions in fuel electrodes. And uh, in one of the articles, I could read that the platinum, which is being conventionally used in fuel cells, or being getting replaced, or there is a proposal, there is a research and a prototype being made with a, a hybrid compound made of water and uh, iron and nickel. So that has a similar characteristics which can replace. Then, of course, there are a lot of efforts put in for carbon, I mean, hydrogen production, storage, and distribution. So, people are talking about the age of electrochemical power. The, they are also trying to find more utilization of hydrogen accelerators. And while these are not only done by research institutes, these are ably supported by the different vehicle manufacturers. So, they are working hand in hand uh, throughout the different parts of the world. These are top five hydrogen fuel technology startups which are impacting the energy. High Tech Park, High Point, Hyon, Anapter, then UP Power Up Energy Technologies. Uh, India also has a lot of research centers. In India, I understand there are a lot of work happening on IIT Madras, IIT Bombay. Few of the specific uh, uh, centers in North India and also like a chemical research center SIGRI in Tamil Nadu. So these are some of the areas where the research is happening. In UK, they have made a fuel, inno fuel cell innovation center in Manchester. And in New York, there is a lot of initiatives being taken for uh, introduction of a massive new hydrogen fuel cell. And there is an innovation center supporting that. Uh, with this, I am coming to end of this session. Uh, to summarize, 
we have talked today about what is hydrogen why hydrogen and how this hydrogen is uh, getting energy or through the chemical reaction in fuel cell how the fuel cell work what are the challenges in handling the fuel cell and uh, globally what are the regulations talking about the fuel cell why fuel cell will be a very good contender for future transportation and future mobility and why and how the different type of mobility options are benefiting from fuel cell we also talked about how initiatives are happening in india and uh, how the government of india are also taking steps there are a lot of recent development how the innovation centers throughout the globe are pioneering this initiatives and why there is the drive and uh, being a uh, young energy uh, profile people like you who have been uh, mentored and groomed through the initiatives like sparkle i'm sure you will find this fuel cells interesting in one or other part of your life it can be taken as out of your own interest you can take some concept you can think of some options and definitely i am very confident in the years to come when you will enter the industry and when you will be part of this industry you will be getting an opportunity to actually work on the fuel cell technology which now we are reading we are experimenting we are doing simulations you are going you people are more uh, blessed you will be definitely seeing the days where it will be uh, running on the roads it will be it may be a contemporary technology during your days uh, with this note i thank again the kpit sparkle team for giving this opportunity hope you find this session interesting Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, myself, the speaker, Abhinash Iske. Uh, I'm a tech lead at Path Partner. I work on uh, certain problem statements on IDAS-based systems and surveillance analytics. Uh, I have my uh, experience, with, uh, I have around 8.5 experience on this domain, uh, working, uh, designing architectures for the customized architectures for uh, uh, challenging use cases for uh, automotive segment, medical segment, and uh, home surveillances. The topic for today is uh, uh, AI-based pedestrian analytics for autonomous vehicles. In today's webinar, uh, we'll be covering the below topics. Introduction to autonomous driving, AI for uh, uh, autonomous driving, uh, and then we shall have deep look into the uh, ASAS system framework and Google view. And, uh, and uh, we look into the uh, deep look into the challenging use cases which uh, in the autonomous driving system. Uh, and then we will look into the AI model development uh, and deployment. Uh, post that, we should provide uh, a, a system uh, GUI overview. Uh, lastly, we will look into the two, sec uh, two sections. Uh, one is the features demo and the key highlights. Uh, before we start our webinar, uh, I would like to mention that ASAS terminology stands for Autonomous uh, Surveillance, uh, Surveillance Analytic Solution. And with that, uh, let's start with today's uh, session by uh, answering the following questions. Need for autonomous driving technology. Uh, uh, based on statistics of last week, there is around 1.5, uh, 1.25 million deaths which is happening all around the world due to road accidents, uh, uh, accidents due to uh, human behavior, uh, sleeping, uh, sleeping distraction and other aspects. Uh, which is equivalent to 3,287 uh, deaths on a daily basis. So uh, we get the importance of having an autonomous technology which uh, uh, helps uh, to make our lives better. Impact on technologies of driving. Uh, currently, uh, with the advancement in technology, uh, it is very uh, useful for us to uh, incorporate the latest technologies in our autonomous driving systems. So current technologies such as IoT, DL, uh, the AI uh, and cloud computing makes it possible for to handle huge complex tasks, which enables fast processing and robust and uh, robust decentralization and scalability for real world uh, problems which we have uh, in the uh, systems. Moving on to the next question, uh, what is how uh, what can we explain brief working of the autonomous driving? Autonomous driving uh, is a vehicle which is capable of sensing its environment uh, and operating without any human intervention. 
a human passenger is neither required to take control uh, of the vehicle and uh, based on the time not have uh, uh, to be always present so that's how the uh, 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 autonomous driving works now moving to the next slide uh, uh, we have uh, certain uh, basics uh, levels uh, in autonomous driving which is defined by uh, society of autonomous engineers so this uh, level ranges from uh, 0 to 5. Uh, level 0, which means that uh, the vehicles are manually controlled by human drivers who monitor the surroundings of the, the surroundings and take decisions. Level 1, where the vehicle features are, are automated for driver assistance such as uh, st uh, steering, uh, or, uh, steering or accelerating, that is cruise control. Level 2 is where the vehicles can the vehicle itself can control both the steering uh, and accelerating and deaccelerating functionality. Level 3 is where an ADAS is programmed based on the environment uh, uh, features and uh, environment features of the data and we, uh, we, we control the vehicle in those aspects. Level 4 is where uh, the self-driving vehicle has additional capabilities like uh, uh, making decisions in case where the, uh, the ADAS features are failing. And level 5 is where uh, cars won't even have a steering wheels or uh, uh, steering wheels for accelerating and deaccelerating, uh, uh, where human intervention is not at all uh, there. So these are the different levels. Uh, yes. Now, uh, now moving on to the next uh, slide uh, of uh, to understand the autonomous uh, driving ecostructure. Autonomous vehicles combine sensors and map data based on machine learning or the experience which they are having and classify objects uh, in their surrounding environments. Like as we are seeing in this picture here, uh, they are likely to uh, take decisions based on uh, other moving vehicles, uh, other moving vehicles, pedestrians, uh, stationary uh, objects like uh, traffic trees, uh, and based on what they see, they try and uh, they take the uh, decisions on that aspects. So uh, in the input can be from either from the leader, the stereo camera or the fish head. And the use cases can be uh, your uh, pedestrian detection, vehicle detection, uh, license plate, in these kinds of uh, aspects. Now moving on to the next slide. Uh, let us now understand how AI can help uh, in, in autonomous driving. So as mentioned previously, uh, ASAS uh, is a defined terminology means autonomous surveillance analytics uh, solutions. ASAS is a framework which integrates deep learning based solutions or vehicles which uh, extracts the salient regions or the features which is very close to the human visual system uh, for real-time uh, inferencing for either video or uh, images. So there are two major purposes uh, uh, for ASAS that is public safety and human supervision. So public safety includes live monitoring of the situations which can reduce uh, traffic congestions. Uh, uh, self parking features in ability which abides by the rule uh, abiding by the rules and regulations of the laid down by the government and and these kinds of uh, aspects for human supervision to prevent uh, scenarios which is which uh, like uh, accidents or uh, accidents caused due to drunken driving uh, distractions uh, from the by the humans and errors caused to them so these kinds of things uh, we can uh, uh, make it much better with human supervision uh, moving on to the uh, next slide, with the understanding what we had previously from the AI for autonomous, we will deep dive into uh, what is ASAS framework. Now, uh, on the left hand side, as you can see here, uh, is is the input sections like previously mentioned, LIDAR, stereo camera, and fisheye camera, which has the different types of inputs. It can be a LIDAR map, depth map, or images. The ASAS uh, framework or a solution takes in those inputs and process it the uh, below features which is mentioned. It can be uh, different types of uh, uh, segmentation, vehicle counting, a key point estimation, and these kinds of features, which we look into it much more in detail. With these uh, features can be deployed both on embedded hardware, desktop, and GPU based systems. If any new requirement comes in from the customers, we take in the input uh, database. Uh, retrain the model and pass it similarly to the yes, as aspects. With this understanding of the AI and or, uh, for autonomous equipment, now we shall deep dive into the feature sections, like on the use case sections, which is available with ASAS. 
So there are uh, different categories of use, uh, use cases which are available. This can be broadly classified into 2D and 3D. In 2D, we have 2D object detection and 2D object recognition and segmentation. In 3D, we have object detection and segmentation. Uh, these are the use cases. Uh, we will uh, focus on uh, the highlighted use case that is the surround view fisheye object detection, key point destination for both vehicles and persons, uh, instance object uh, segment, uh, segmentation, and 3D object semantic segmentation. These are the more challenging use cases which we have based and which we have covered. So we'll deep dive into that in the uh, next uh, uh, slides. Before, uh, before we deep dive into all the individual features and see the demos and understand uh, this thing, let's have a basic understanding of the AI model uh, uh, development and deployment. So SaaS models are uh, developed, uh, are customized and developed only for the uh, specific use cases which can be integrated with the framework. It has both the combinations of both AI and uh, ML, uh, CV based algorithms which are implemented to solve a uh, very corner-based uh, uh, corner failure cases, uh, solutions for that aspects. Now, uh, we, uh, these SAC frameworks are, are, are trained on public data sets uh, like PestMod, uh, FishEye, Coco, and Human Poses, uh, which gives uh, very good uh, accuracy. And uh, the, these have been defined for much more on a standard uh, classes like persons, cars, pants, uh, birds, bags, plots. So this uh, includes the entire the view of the sea. Uh, these are the uh, uh, AI more architectures and models in ASS. Now, uh, we process the online or the offline data which is given to the ASS and we store it in either in the cloud or, uh, or local directory for two key purposes. One is offline data analytics and the second is data aggregation for uh, retraining and upgrading the model. Now look into the uh, uh, deployment aspects. So in deployment as aspects, there are three questions which we have to answer. What is ASAS point deployment platforms and performance analysis? So as we are aware, processing real-time information in recent years uh, helps us to develop more um, uh, use cases uh, for uh, solving the real-life problems. Now, uh, we use ONNX. So ONNX is an open neural network exchange uh, which uh, which can take any model, which is AI model, which is trained either in PyDOS or TensorFlow, and con and convert it into an ONNX format, which uh, uses, uh, which can be deployed on the constrained devices or embedded devices. So, what are the deployment platforms which we have for the ASAS? Now, ASAS models are converted into ONNX uh, formats and can be deployed, which uh, which helps us to deploy it on the edge-based devices. As, uh, which has Linux or Windows uh, operating systems. Uh, now, ONNX mo models are deployed on runtime platforms like NVIDIA, uh, Qualcomm, Sofeno, Descent. Uh, what what is the performance analysis we, we get after the conversion? That uh, yeah. So the uh, the AI models which we have developed uh, gives a good performance uh, uh, with with a drop of five percent uh, dropping the accuracy compared to the original model during the conversion. Uh, since the new operations, whatever we are using for conversions, are not supported uh, currently, so there is uh, we have to uh, have a, an overlook at that, and we are getting with a bit of five percent uh, accuracy drop. Now uh, let's look into the uh, brief look into the overview of the uh, autonomous uh, so that's ASS the GUI framework. So as you can see, this is the GUI which we are having the solutions or the GUI solution which we are having. On this can be divided into three different sections: the input section, the output section, and the display section. In the input section, we have different options like the sensor, the AI methods, uh, camera perspectives, uh, classes which we want to detect, features, the AI model architecture, uh, which we which we generally use, tracker, and devices which can be deployed in uh, in other aspects. Now, in the sensors, we currently are supporting camera, lidar, and radar-based sensors. And AI methods, as we mentioned, uh, we look into 2D and 3D uh, aspects. With camera perspectives, we have high level AGL, bull mobile, and fission. And with class selections, generally, in, uh, we look into persons, vehicles, and other, around 80 other classes. Features, there are, uh, as mentioned, there are one features for both that are available with these solutions. 
on the right hand side uh, is the output section where we have the results data which come up, which keeps on uh, flowing we can save this data for future analytics and it's a real time on, uh, on the lower block of the UI you can see the real time analysis which you can see uh, which gives the uh, statistics of the current process running the center is the display section where you can see the output uh, live and we have certain controlling units, uh, controlling buttons for the start, stop to load the input data and uh, other aspects. Uh, with the detailed understanding what we had with each com component in the UI, let's now we deep dive into the feature use cases which we, uh, know, which we want to focus on. So currently, as mentioned, uh, we should look into uh, the first use case that is the uh, surround view fisheye object detection. So currently I'm playing an offline video. Uh, we, uh, what is the surround view fisheye object detection? So there has been significant rights in the uh, usage of fisheye cameras for various automotive applications. Uh, these monitoring systems uh, are uh, and gives a uh, field of view, high field of view. Uh, on 180 degree and they are mounted at uh, all the four corners of the uh, the weight the only problem which they are having is uh, uh okay the the challenge is what we face when we do detections in this kind of when we have the ai models in this space uh the radial distortions which we have uh, of the objects and uh, the objects are sizes so the size of the objects are not that accurate uh, or I would say they are more uh, extra, uh, not in real time. Uh, but uh, the advantage what we are having is uh, we will get around a 360 degree field of view when uh, when this device is placed. So uh, where can we use this kind of uh, cameras? So fisheye cameras are generally used for uh, uh, traffic conjunctions, collision detections, uh, uh, jab assistance and all. So as you as you can see here, uh, uh, collision detections like uh, if any vehicles are coming in, um, it can be both static and uh, stationary and not stationary vehicles. So stationary vehicles, uh, we can estimate the distance and we can tell them that okay, there is there is object nearby and please be aware of it. But non-stationary because there is the vehicles which are moving, it will be, uh, it will be uh, difficult for us. We have to estimate the future where, where uh, they are going to move. So during these types of scenarios, uh, having a surround view camera helps us to detect these uh, uh, non-stationary uh, uh, objects and take decisions with respect to the ape driving. So this is the demo. As you can see, we are able to detect all the uh, objects in the uh, given scene, uh, cars, uh, uh, persons. This helps to take in that you know, taking the account the uh, use cases which I mentioned or the applications. So here detecting at this aspects, so we are doing uh, this runs at uh, real time. So whatever the issues we have uh, we have with the uh, fisheye cameras, that is the radiant distortions and other aspects, uh, we are processing directly on it. So this helps us to have uh, a real time inference uh, for our use cases. Now moving on to the next uh, use case uh, is the and, and, and key point uh, detections of both the uh, vehicles and the pedestrians. Now, key point estimation is estimating the spatial and uh, spatial location of the uh, human body or the vehicles uh, with, uh, from the uh, devices which we have obtained from the stereo cameras or the cameras which we are having. So, these key points can be uh, for human bodies. It can be the right shoulder, uh, nose, eyes, uh, ankles, waist in these kinds of scenario. For the vehicles, it is uh, more defined to the front uh, uh, paint bombers, uh, tires, and these kinds of aspects. So this uh, uh, post key point post estimation helps us to estimate uh, the behavior of a person or a vehicle in a real time scenario. So from along with the detection and uh, uh, estimation, we are able to get uh, what what is the behavior of that person. More, uh, say, if we are having object detection gives us the localization aspect, but key point the detection gives us more in terms of uh, the uh, uh, actions or the the behavior of the uh, persons. And uh, here, um, in this uh, use case, the challenges what we face in most of the time is the occlusions, uh, the uh, uh, erratic behavior of people and uh, the lighting conditions. 
So uh, what we have derived from our solutions, we are able to detect most of the input and its behavior, even, even when they are occluded. So as you can see, the even when half of the persons are visible, we are able to uh, detect them and uh, even with different clothing which with their hair. The same goes with for the vehicles also. So if uh, there are two or three vehicles which are uploaded and other aspects, we, we can detect the uh, uh, back end and uh, back end of the lake and the roof and other uh, aspects. So this, this has a uh, very wide uh, application cases uh, like human activity recognition, uh, motion trajectory, uh, uh, human fall detection, these kinds of uh, aspects. So till now, whatever we saw, it was in the 2D object detection uh, and 2D object recognition. Now, this is the uh, third category, which is 2D, uh, 2D object segmentation. So segmentation plays a huge role uh, in any domain. Uh, why? Because uh, from boarding box, you can get the localization aspects. Uh, but segmentation gives you the well-defined boundary. So as you can see, it clearly distinguishes between, uh, on a pixel level, the uh, boundary of a vehicle. Localization gives you the uh, uh, the bounding box or the object detection gives you the area of the vehicle. But uh, uh, instant segmentation, which is uh, segmentation gives you the pixel level the boundary uh, aspects. So the challenges what we face in this uh, uh, use case is uh, getting the exact mask level, so getting a defined, very defined boundary of that object, occlusions, occlusions of the people and other aspects, uh, lighting conditions, like as I am showing here. Uh, so these are the uh, key ch uh, challenges we face. Now, when we have uh, defined our constraint, the model uh, changed our architectures and other aspects. So as you can see, we are able to uh, detect the persons in here at the vicinity, uh, both during the uh, daytime and down the uh, night scenarios, and we are getting the fairly uh, well-defined masks, uh, which uh, helps to take better decisions on on the uh, when 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 we are driving. So one of the aspects, uh, one of the use which is more challenging is this one. Now moving on to the uh, uh, next use case is the uh, 3D object uh, segmentation. So this is again uh, the last category uh, in our aspect. Uh, so 3D object segmentation. So uh, in 3D object segmentation, uh, we are looking at the 3D point cloud data. So the data obtained from a radar aspect. Uh, now, uh, as you are seeing here, the doing object detection uh, is a fairly uh, easier task on point cloud data, but doing segmentation is pretty very difficult, uh, very difficult uh, use case to solve. Why? Because there are certain challenges which we face. Challenges are the sparsity of the point load data. Long, since it's a radar, uh, uh, they are unstructured due to the sizes of the objects. The device, the, so what what kind of uh, uh, points they are capturing from the radar device. So we have to incorporate all of this and on the scene level also. So as you can see, uh, we are able to uh, segment the uh, very well the objects in our, in our vicinity. So uh, here, since it's a segmentation based activity, we have defined each point in uh, uh, different category or different classes. We are uh, using a uh, customized AI model. So the green color signifies the vegetation, uh, uh, the orange color signifies the vehicle, uh, and uh, the cyan color signifies the building. So for our uh, reference, we have a 2D image on the right hand side. So as you can see, the cars are parked. So in certain scenarios, we are able to see uh, outside that, uh, where images we cannot see, even those scenarios we are able to uh, do uh, detections from the data based around devices. So outside here, here as you can see, so cars, cars are parked uh, behind the trees. Along with the segmentation of the tree, we are able to see that there is a I am lastly coming to uh, the last slide, uh, that is the key highlights. So what is the, uh, what are the key highlights of this ASAS solution? So ease of integration, uh, so first one is the ease of integration. We can easily integrate any AI architecture uh, based on the use cases with the current solution what we are having. Second is the deployment. So we can deploy it on any embedded platform like as previously mentioned cross-domain applications. So we can deploy this for uh, automotive, 
uh, surveillances, medical images. So whatever uh, models we have developed can have this cross-function uh, functionality, which uh, with data tweaking, we are able to uh, use it for those applications. And, di uh, and di diversity. So as we in sub, we are able to cover both 2D and 3D for different different devices, like when say different devices, both fisheye cameras, stereo cameras, and data these uh, devices. And uh, that's KPI is packed for giving you this opportunity to do here to showcase my work. And uh, so uh, the young generation or the young mind who are having currently the technologies advanced, we are having everything in our uh, uh, we, we are we, we are everything at our reach. So use the I would encourage all the young minds to uh, look into the more challenging use cases. Uh, I try to solve the problems which are uh, more tougher so that uh, we can have uh, it helps the society uh, more in terms of making our lives better and uh, uh, enriching our uh, stake uh, please keep motivate motivate yourselves to uh, um, attend like this event uh, so that you can gain uh, experiences and knowledge from other uh, team members